Please welcome our opening session with Conservation International's Chairman and CEO, Peter Seligman, Vice Chair, Harrison Ford, and our moderator, the Managing Editor of Fortune, Andy Serwer. Thank you very, very much, Jeffrey. It's great to be here. This uh, is shaping up already to be the best brainstorm green we've ever had. Uh, the attendance is um, big, deep, it's a lot of great people. And uh, I think you can see that from uh, the way we're going to get started here this afternoon with Harrison Ford and Peter Seligman. Thank you guys both so much for coming. Well, thank you for having us. Appreciate it. So we're going to have a wide ranging kind of a macro level discussion to start things off. Uh, before we get more granular in a number of sessions over the next couple of days. And I wanted to start off um, with you, Peter, and have you talk a little bit about, you have got this concept of natural capital. And uh, don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about, because that's going to be a bad start. Um, <laughs> a concept of natural capital. Um, I guess I just wanted to ask you what the heck you mean by that. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. and. Um, um, I wish I could, I could claim that it's, it's our concept. I think that it's a, it's a simple concept, though. Uh, and the concept of natural capital is, is uh, that nature provides essential goods, services uh, to all countries. And actually, uh, the natural world is what defines the future, the present of nations. So whether it's the, the barrier islands that protect the coastline or whether it's the forests that provide water or protect soils or whether it's the savannas that are transporting water or the aquifers, uh, coral reefs as, as protein factories. Basically, nature is the capital upon which all economies and all nations are actually dependent. And so at uh, Conservation International, um, our, our grail is that, um, that the central precept of a healthy, sustainable society is the maintenance, the protection of natural capital. And when you lose that natural capital, when you erode that base of natural capital, it leads to uh, real challenges for nations. And today, uh, especially when, when uh, you look at the strange behavior and climate and you look at, uh, at uh, from you know, the poles to the acidification of oceans to the the uh, extreme droughts, floods. Um, what we're seeing is uh, a kind of an upside down, a weirding of climate that is coincidental and convergent with the, uh, the loss of ecosystem health. And when you have those two things coming together, um, you have real dire straits for nations. So we really believe we need to, as a core principle of any healthy society, maintain that natural capital. Now you need to have intellectual capital, you need financial capital. There's a whole range of capitals that come together to have a solid, sustainable, healthy economy. We focus on the natural capital. All right, we want to drill down on that a little bit more, but Harrison, did he get any of that right? About 90%. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are other uh, illustrations of, uh, of the free services of nature. For instance, uh, pollinators for our crops, mm -hmm. uh, sources of, uh, of future medicines and pharmaceuticals. Um, there are many, many uh, services of nature which are irreplaceable to the extent that we cannot afford to provide them for ourselves when a healthy nature provides it for us. Right. Nature doesn't need uh, people. People need nature. If uh, the human population was sloughed off this planet, it'd come back fine. Right. But we need it uh, for our, our economic uh, health and, and uh, viability. We need it for our children's future. So it's our job uh, to cause it and develop uh, uh, strategies to maintain it. Let me ask you, Harrison, you've been involved um, with CI for, for more than 20 years now, um, and you obviously are very passionate about it. You spend a tremendous amount of time um, working um, with that organization. How did you get involved initially, and what do you do? Uh, there. I mean, I, you know, 42 yeah. is a terrific movie, no, by no, the way. No, I became involved 20, 
25 years ago, there was a, I had a, a, a suffered an unconscionable excess of resources. And I was looking for some way to, to redeem myself morally. <laughs> <coughs> and, uh, and Conservation International has to help. We, pro help we provide that service it's, to anybody, yeah. by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> help turn me around. Uh, but also I found a, an incredible brain trust of people who were working to do something I thought was really critical. And for me, the opportunity of coming from the world I uh, uh, normally exist in to be part of that uh, that conversation is is uh, really very stimulating to me and I, it um, so I operate as every other board member does uh, you know involved in the minutia of running our business and and uh, uh, um, maintaining the uh, sanity of our efforts and uh, I'm uh, uh, Thrilled to be to be involved and in, uh, very excited about the work that we have done and the, the way the organization has developed in the last 20 years. When I started with this, with the CI, we had a five million dollar budget and we were uh, um, we were involved in the first uh, debt for nature swap, which is, was a very significant um, change in the way conservation was done. We were. Cl um, uh, teaching indigenous people to collect tagua nuts, which are palm uh, nuts, and uh, which can be turned into buttons. So we were providing economic uh, alternatives to unsustainable development mm -hmm. at the very beginning. And then we became involved in uh, 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 conservation corridors and relationships uh, between um, uh, countries that had uh, 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 the same border where we could develop uh, sanctuaries for migrating animals and the development, uh, the uh, protection of biodiversity. And, uh, and, and we've evolved to, uh, to the point where we are now um, phrasing our argument, which is the same argument, around the protection of nature's resources for human um, um, uh, development and what, what's the phrase? You were, that, that's about a 90. It, human well-being, <laughs> human well-being. Grading each other. Yeah. Human well-being. There you go. Okay. Keep well, actually, what, what happened was about five years ago, um, we were thinking about the great accomplishments, and sometimes you sit there and you congratulate yourself, and, and all the biodiversity areas that were protected and put into the conservation pantry, and what we began to reflect on was the fact that while we could applaud ourselves during that 20 years prior, uh, when we were talking about all the great successes of protection of biodiversity, extinction rates had accelerated, global fisheries had collapsed, and climate was even weirder. And we thought, actually, what we've done is we've continued this uh, concept of there's conservation here and there's development there. And mm -hmm. the real solution has got to be a conservation part of development, which is why everybody's here. I mean, it's, we've got to transform the way development takes place so that we actually are looking long term at what is our society going to look like? How will it last? How do you deal with, with going from 7 billion to 9 billion people, you know, doubling water, food, energy needs um, at the same time that you turn things upside down? And so what we decided was let's rethink how development takes place. And you guys are making a connection, a direct connection between international conservation and economic and national security. I mean, that may be lost on a lot of people. What is that connection? Well, um, it actually, we did something a couple of years ago which most, uh, which was unusual for the conservation movement. Uh, we hired a Republican to be the head of our US government policy work. And, um, and what we learned quickly was that uh, when you went on the Hill to a Congress that was really dominated, um, uh, by uh, the Republican Party, that when you talked about climate change and were, sh were shrill about kind of the dangers, uh, we were dismissed. Marginalized. Marginalized. And so we thought, okay, this is actually, we got to get a we got to begin to use arguments that people will hear. And the argument that is really powerful and is very, very real is that when you turn uh, environmental issues upside down and you destroy fisheries and forests and water sources, all the impact of, of misuse of ecosystems and climate shifts, uh, you create national security problems. And so uh, what we did was we put together a short film called Direct Connection. And Harrison, 
uh, Rob Walton, the chairman of Walmart, and Wes Bush, the CEO of uh, Northrop Grumman, mm -hmm. all three on our board, did this short, and it was not about CI. It was not a promotional film. It was an issues concept, that there is a direct connection between the ecosystem, between economic health and national security, and investments in international conservation. And Harrison, you went up to the hill, right? Well, I went with Rob and, and Peter. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we used this as a, uh, an icebreaker, a door opener. And it was very successful in, uh, in engaging uh, those people on the hill who might not have uh, welcomed us so warmly. Um, but it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a powerful argument, and it, and it the, for instance, the, the, what's happening with uh, Somali pirates, mm -hmm. you, can, you can look at that and recognize that it, it's the collapse of the fisheries that put uh, the sustainable mm. fishing Mm -hmm. um, that uh, men equipped with boats uh, had uh, no other options but to be involved in piracy. And that's cost us and the rest of our NATO partners $2 billion uh, to, uh, mm -hmm. to try and redress. Um, that's a, that's a, the, econo the national security uh, connection to an um, um, environmental issue. It's a, a great conservation example. Mm -hmm. issue. We had, a, we had a meeting uh, that we did jointly with the Council of Foreign Relations about three weeks, four weeks ago. And, and uh, Richard Haas, who's the president of the council, mm -hmm. sits on our board of directors. And so we, we did a collaboration of uh, the council and CIA just talking about this issue. And uh, with leadership from the CIA, National Intelligence Council, uh, corporations, all there actually really showing that you know, this is no longer a secret. The National Intelligence Council, Major General, retired Major General and Elgin, was really was saying, we actually are now beginning to document shifts in the jet stream and the impact that has on, ocean, on, on currents, the impact that has on precipitation. And so th as things get turned upside down, you have displaced peoples. They can't get water. They can't get fish. And they are not going to sit where they are. They're going to go where they have to go to take care of their families. And that's really stirring things up. And it's an opportunity uh, when these uh, populations are dislocated. Uh, there's the opportunity for them to be radicalized, mm -hmm. uh, um, for uh, the pressure on the on the countries that receive them to be uh, an issue amongst them. And so these uh, these pockets of uh, of um, regional um, uh, conflict. Are, are, are a significant issue all over the world. And many of them are, are the result of uh, failures of conservation um, practices. I mean, is this kind of the primary focus of what you're doing? Is this opportunistic? Um, or is this the best case argument? Is this the best way to accomplish your goals? Or is this the it's biggest a, impact of what you it's guys? It's adaptive. Mm -hmm. What we're needing to do is to uh, convince our government um, <clears throat> governments. Our go well, but the main source for international conservation has been uh, both international organizations and the United States government who have recognized it as in their self-interest. Mm -hmm. When the conservate, when funding was uh, about to be cut off completely for the global uh, environmental facility, mm -hmm. which is uh, 182 nations, including the United States and international organizations. Um, which uh, supports uh, conservation efforts throughout the world. Um, this connection between uh, national security and conservation uh, uh, failures uh, resulted in Congresswoman Kay Granger, Granger Texas, uh, mm -hmm. Texas uh, who, who's the head of the uh, House Appropriations Subcommittee, um, to, to get on uh, the bandwagon and to increase the funding of the GEF from uh, 89 to 122 yeah. million, uh, mm -hmm. million dollars. So in this period of sequestration, the investment in the development assistance account of USAID has gone from 2.5 to 2.7 billion, and GEF from 90 to 120. Uh, that was last year, and then, then you- This year, this year. This went, year, but then you got chopped a little bit from the sequestration? Well, 5%. It went up 
about right. 25% and then 5% off. So well, the, net, the net is up, right. which yeah. is really okay. surprising. But, but, you know, I want to... the threat was there that there was the, the, not going to yeah, be Yeah, before was, you were going to get nothing at all. You got a 25, right. okay, right. Yeah. Right. But, but I was going to just, just add to, you ask if this is, uh, you know, it is adaptive, mm -hmm. but, but the main thing that we are trying to do as an institution is really demonstrate to nations that that they need to put a value on their natural capital. They need to understand what they have. They understand their dependency upon that natural capital for the stability of their nation, for the treasury of the people that are poor, and to, uh, to account for that. Right, and Harrison, we were talking on the phone the other day, and you were asking, and this is a good question, whether uh, companies have facilities to actually be able to account for this capital on their balance sheets and income statements. And Peter, you were addressing that a little bit? Well, it's dealing with both companies, and I think we're gonna hear from Puma a little later. Mm -hmm. They're kind of the pioneers in this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's not just companies, it's right. countries. Right. So um, a year ago, um, actually May 24th, 25th, one of our board members who's the president of the country of Botswana, Ian Kama, hosted along with Rob Walton and Lorene Powell Jobs, uh, two other board members, so all three on the board, a summit of heads of state of African, sub-Saharan sub African nations. Um. The simple purpose of that summit was to explain, discuss, and conclude with these heads of state that their accounting of their, 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 nat their, their national income accounting assets needed to include natural assets. And they need to be an accounting on the books of the value they get from their forests, their coral reefs, their savannas, mm -hmm. you know, their wildlife, et cetera. So that as with all individuals, you're trying to figure out is your balance sheet getting better or worse, and they can measure the increase. So that conclusion was called the Gabroni Declaration in May 25th last year, uh, with 10 nations, heads of state, not only signing this, but agreeing to an annual transparent audit of what's the value. And that was taken to Rio where 50 other countries signed up. So right now there's a big movement for nations to say, we now understand we better include in our accounting what we've got from nature. I mean, this is such big thing stuff. And in a way you're violating the old bumper sticker though, which is to think globally, act locally. You're thinking globally and acting globally, right? Does right. that work? Yeah, well, our motto is head in the sky, feet in the mud. And we really think that, you know, you gotta do both. You can't just, if you just look at the detail, you don't see the big picture. And if you just look at the big picture, you don't connect it to what really impacts people on the ground, you're not gonna have impact or success. So you really you gotta bring those together. Right. One of the distinguishing things about CI for me from the very beginning was our, our decision uh, to work with um, business. Mm -hmm. To work with uh, which those partners which at, at the beginning uh, of, uh, of our history were thought by many uh, uh, conservation organizations to be the enemy. Mm -hmm. So, and we have worked with them consistently over the years to develop best practices to involve them in uh, in uh, mitigation of of their impacts. And uh, and as partners, uh, uh, and we've had some wonderful partners: so Walmart and Starbucks and, uh, and Disney, McDonald's. Disney, McDonald's, Marriott. Uh, Northrop Grumman, and and part of this, the issue of uh, 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 conservation failures and national security is also the question of economic security mm -hmm. of of the United States, and businesses have understood this much more quickly than uh, governmental uh, um, uh, authorities have, and business has adapted. Uh, um, uh, their practices to understand that if they don't have, if they're not protecting their supply side of their business, mm -hmm. if they don't have a sustainable supply side, um, um, their business is going to change and not for the better. But I mean, the, trying to get this done with, with countries, you, you have uh, hundreds of countries come together at, at these big uh, uh, global conferences. Mm -hmm. And treaties are very hard to negotiate. And, uh, and then if you do get a treaty, you bring it back here and it doesn't get ratified. So it's, it's, the, it's businesses that, that recognize their self-interest is in uh, acting yeah. uh, quickly and getting the job yeah. done. So. I would say that if there is a, another kind of term that is kind of really drives our conversations, it's enlightened self-interest. Mm -hmm. And 
If you can make a powerful argument that this is actually in a business enlightened self-interest, a community self-interest, a nation self-interest, they take note. And for us, it was really making certain that political leaders and business leaders began to understand that, that their very survival depends upon r really including the health of nature as an essential part of their strategy. Right. You know, one of the, the most encouraging things that we have seen uh, has been uh, an alignment of 15 nations right now in the South Pacific. So right. these 15 nations, uh, countries like Kiribati, uh, Tuvalu, Tokelau, Cook Island, nations that no one's ever heard of. Uh, there are 15 of them. They don't have a navy, they don't have an army, they don't have a coast guard, they don't have an air force, right. yet they control 8% of the Earth's surface and 60% of the global tuna population. And they've come together and said, we need help in securing this area that's, that's you know, 23 states of Alaska. They're doing it not because they want to be generous, but because the whole world is taking what they got and they want to make certain that they can have it sustained so they can continue to be the beneficiaries of the management of those fisheries. So we have something called the Pacific Oceanscape right. where we work with them, just to get to scale. So I want to throw uh, the floor open to questions. Um, if any of you all have anything you'd like to ask these two gentlemen. I can see someone here. Some, we got some microphones coming around. Hi, Joe Confina from The Guardian. Um, the other side of the coin is obviously that there are a lot of people in the environmental mo movement who says nature is the commons. And as soon as you start putting a dollar sign on a forest and a dollar sign on a reef, that actually you're bringing nature into the economic system. And at that point, it can business or governments, they can actually pervert the course of that action and actually can become a problem rather than a solution. How are you going to avoid bringing what is the commons, what actually has a spiritual and value well beyond just an economic value. How do you protect that as well? Well, I don't think you should limit the value of nature to just an economic value to start. I mean, there's clearly many values for nature, and spiritual value is essential. And in many nations, uh, that really is a dominating value. Uh, but if something is not valued and not recognized to contribute something that's constructive and proactive and essential and undervalued, uh, it can be discarded uh, very, very easily. And so I don't think you really have an either or. You actually have to promote all these different values. We're running short on time. I want to ask you guys two last questions. Harrison, have you ever considered um, putting your two worlds together, which is making a film um, that would be sort of a cause movie, or does, does that not work? Is it, are there always two separate worlds that you're going to be in, in a way? Yeah. Uh, I do, I do think that's uh, it's, it's right. It doesn't really work very well. Um, uh, uh, I'm in show business. Uh, right. We're an entertainment uh, uh, mm -hmm. activity. And, uh, you know, the, what happens when you, when you it's co-opting an issue mm -hmm. and then presenting right. a, a solution to it in two hours. Yeah. Yeah, with a nice tight bow on it at the end. It doesn't really work. Right. So I, you know, I'm very. I have yet to read anything that really uh, w was a great movie. Yeah, I think that's probably pretty realistic. And then finally, uh, Peter, what would you say would be the most important thing um, to to business people um, in terms of how they should maybe think about things or doing some things differently? I think that all businesses need to understand that the stress on environment will affect their customers their shareholders, uh, their employees, uh, their bottom line. And so every business has got to look at this in a different way, uh, but looking at supply chain, looking at efficiency, looking at long-term solutions uh, to, uh, to ensure that revenue exceeds expenses is directly connected to putting a value on their dependence on natural capital and really anticipating this. You know, businesses have a real handicap, um, which is they got to do quarterly Earnings. I wish they didn't know. I w I'd love to see them stop doing that hmm. so that you can actually have a long term horizon and really build your brand based upon the contribution that you can make and the quality of your business, as opposed to kind of trying to make certain that, that, that uh, the analysts love what you're saying every quarter. I think that really is disruptive. Um, and, uh, and that really is, you know, I, you know that's you know, my advice. I think the good news is that um, uh, this conference wouldn't have taken place, you know. 10 years ago. And every year, it's, it's you know, generating more and more interest. Right. 
Um, and I think that for a while there it was flatlined. I mean, I think that we started sustainability conversations. Many companies got involved. Uh, it was kind of, you know, how do you really sh make sure that it pays? I think now there's a spirit of innovativeness that right. is very different, and it's pervasive, and it's, it's every university, every business, every country, you know, every school system, and that's the breakthrough. We need breakthroughs, and, and, and I'm seeing those in the work that I'm in all over the world. It's not just happening here. Right. It happens all over the world. And, and um, you know, I, I would just kind of, you know, end with, with kind of, you know, my, my thoughts just with one. I, I just came back from, from Tanzania. And I went to Tanzania to launch something with the Gates Foundation called the Vital Signs Network, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a global monitoring looking at ecosystem contributions to agricultural production. We went out into a, into a community uh, to, uh, to visit with some farmers. And what we found there is the reality that the rest of the world is dealing with. Mm -hmm. We found a farmer named, her name is Mama Laura, two or three acres, growing corn to eat. She's doing four plantings of corn each year now because precipitation cycles are so turned upside down that she doesn't know, they no longer know when it's going to rain. Mm. So they don't have enough corn to eat. And so what they're doing is they're looking for a cash crop. Right. Their cash crop is the forest. It's converting it to charcoal, mm, right. selling in town. Yeah. And so what we're seeing are really turn, we're seeing cycle turned upside down. And we need some innovations in food production, water production, in really trailing, in addressing these issues so that we don't end up with some short-term solution that doesn't anticipate the unintended consequences. And it's coming from business. Right. It's coming from the developing technologies that all of you are investing in. Great, well let's hope we're gonna be getting to a lot of those uh, discussions and solutions, I hope, over the next couple of days. Please join me in thanking Harrison Ford and Peter Seller. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. I'm going to stay up. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, thank you. That was great. Thanks. Thank you. All right. That was great. Um, that, was, that was terrific. Um, now uh, we are going to come to what has become sort of a ritual um, at Brainstorm Green, um, which is uh, ensuring our seating, comfort, and sustainability of posture throughout the conference. So please join me in welcoming Mark Sherman, Director of Corporate Communications of Herman Miller, assisting Mark with a demonstration. She was very uh, eager to do this uh, as Fortune's Assistant Managing Editor, Lee Gallagher. Come on, give it up. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> eager to do it. Great, Lee. Uh, thank you, Andy, I appreciate that. And uh, uh, good afternoon, all. So on behalf of Herman Miller, the people of Herman Miller, it is great to be back as a sponsor again uh, this is an event that we have a great appreciation for, the, the mission, the purpose, the spirit, and uh, it's great to be able to participate in it with you, and hopefully through our product we add a little something to your overall experience here at the event, which is why I'm here uh, to do a little Aaron Chair tutorial, and uh, Lee Gallagher has very graciously volunteered to be a part of our little training session. For some of you it might be uh, a refresher, maybe for some others it's the first time, so Hopefully on the other side of this quick little training, you'll, uh, you'll be able to make some adjustments to your chair and make sure that you're dialed in for optimum comfort. So I'm gonna talk Lee through the adjustments, invite you to sort of follow along. Maybe this will help make it a bit more real for you. And, uh, and then at the end, we'll hand out uh, Aaron Chair 101 certificates or something, I'm not sure. <laughs> so um, the first thing that we wanna do is make sure that the height is correct. And the key there is that you want to be able to rest your feet comfortably flat on the floor. Now, you'll see Lee has some great heels on, so <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna call that flat. Um, but then the key that is would be an exaggeration of the <laughs> highest order. Then the key is that your upper legs, your thighs, should be parallel to the floor. So Lee, if you turn, they'll see. So that chair is a little bit low for Lee. So to the right hand side just below the seat edge, there's a paddle. If you pull up on that paddle, raise your weight off the chair, it will rise up, you can release it where it's optimum. Now if the chair's too tall for you, keep your weight in the chair, pull up on the paddle, and it'll lower to wherever is ideal for you. So that's the seat height. Now, we'll turn to the left, here we go. 
So the next adjustment is what we call the tilt limiter. There's actually two paddles on this side. I'm going to ask you to ignore the front paddle. That's actually for if you were doing intensive keyboarding. We don't need to worry about that here. So ignore the front paddle, but the rear paddle is actually going to limit the range of the recline. So Lee, you can lean back now. So you can see Lee can go through the range of recline, but if you lean forward and then pull up on that rear paddle, and now if she tries to lean back, it's basically limited the range that she can go. She can sit forward, the chair will come up with you into a full posture, but you, if you lean back again, that's where you've set it. Now if you want to release it, lean forward, take the weight off of the back and then push down, and you'll hear a slight click and now you should be able to sit, lean back and it, it's released and free moving. If you want to lock it upright so that you're not worrying about that recline during the day, then all you need to do is when you're sitting fully upright, just lift that rear paddle and you will be locked in place. But let's release it for a minute because we're going to talk a little bit about tilt tension. So now if you'll turn back around. So if when you were leaning through that chair recline, you felt like it was either too loose, like you were sort of falling through space, or it was too resistant, maybe um, you felt like you had to really push against it, you can adjust for that. There's a forward knob. There it is. Just Now, if you turn it forward towards your knees, you're adding tension. If you turn it back towards the back of the chair, you're reducing the tension. That's really a matter of personal preference. Generally, I would say if you've got a heavier upper body, you tend to want to have more resistance. If you have a lighter upper body, particularly women, you tend to want to dial it back. Now, I will tell you, you may have to turn that a dozen or more times because we've created it specifically so there's a wide range of adjustment and a lot of micro adjustment, but it's worth it to get that dialed in if you're going to be in that chair all day because it's really much more comfortable. And I will tell you, my own preference, if I dial it in, you can actually get a float in the chair, which is one of the reasons why we've sold, I think last time I counted, seven million of these chairs. So uh, it's a very, very comfortable ride when you get it dialed into your fit. Well, almost done. Last two adjustments. For the arms, you want to be able to rest your elbows, forearms comfortably on the pads of the arm. Now, if you have to reach for it, they're too low. If your shoulders are scrunched up, it's too high. To adjust that, let me just show right here, there is where the chair arm meets the frame, there's a lever. You can release that, raise and lower the arm, and lock it back in place. The last adjustment, so Lee, this is a quiz. Tilt limiter, lock the chair all the way forward. All right. Perfect, and then turn around so we can show them the right side, I'm sorry, the right side of the chair, there we go. Now, this is what we call your posture fit. This is sort of an advanced form of lumbar support. So at the very bottom of the chair, just to the rear here and to the back, right there. Oh, yeah. Now, when you've got it locked up right, you'll be able to feel this better. That's why I asked her to do that. Turning it all the way forward, you will feel that pad come into the sacral area of your back. And I would suggest you take it forward to the point where it almost gets uncomfortable. Because at that point then, you start to then ease off, just let it go back just a little bit, and you will suddenly feel this sort of aha moment where it's a snug fit, but it's not uncomfortable. It's, it's kind of that optimal lumbar support. And with that, uh, and you can remember all of that, then you will have uh, been able to adjust your air and chair, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to be comfortable and enjoy what I think is going to be a terrific program these next few days. And thank you, Lee. That's it. That was so easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Well, that was fun. Thank you, Mark.